and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank um, everyone for having the mental space to be here. I know that there's a lot going on, but yeah, uh, we have to do this. So I hope that we're all safe in our homes uh, this quarantine period. So I'll be delivering my lecture, um, like what Gabby said, uh, entitled Ecophobia and Errancy in the Epics, um, an eco-critical reading of the Panay Sugidanon. So this lecture stems from my um, current research interest on eco-criticism, which I think in this juncture of um, the history of global catastrophe and crisis remains an urgent concern. Um, not only uh, a thorough engagement with the natural world at large, but also I think um, that kind of interdisciplinary thought needed to, to make sense of our own ecological um, condition. So I envision my, my current uh, research project to be following these trajectories of interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary um, studies of um, yeah, the environment. So um, I would like to begin by, you know, some preliminary remarks on the field that I find myself in. Um, one of the most cited definitions of eco-criticism is from uh, Cheryl Glotfelty, who defined it as the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment. According to her, the stance that eco-criticism must take in its analysis is one that is earth-centered, that is to say, how has nature been represented in works of art? How does this representation play out in the conceptualization of the encounter between human and non-human entities in literature? And how does this open up an interdisciplinary approach to studying literature? Glotfelty distills the essential inquiry of eco-criticism as the foundational premise that human culture is connected to the physical world, affecting it and affected by it. As a critical stance, it has one foot in literature, and on the other hand, on land, as a theoretical discourse, it negotiates between the human and the non-human. However, such a definition can run the danger of reducing forms of knowledge or knowledges that might be specific to a particular locale, um, given that terms that are used in eco-criticism, such as nature, place, culture, are polyvalent. Uh, for example, the complex interplay between human consciousness and environmental concerns can never be divorced from its material, material reality that can only be examined by looking at how nature itself has been configured in cultural forms such as literature. In short, the very definition of ecology has to be situated in particular conditions, which include in our case, and which I, I will show later on, colonialism, imperialism, and modernity, all of which are preconditions for and remain to be the hinge by which um, any serious ecological inquiry can proceed. So for me, this merits significant attention precisely because the consciousness that conceives the idea of the non-human other is rooted in history, which for the case of the Global South remains intertwined with the trauma of colonialism that has radically changed the way we view nature. Um, nature as wilderness, for example, nature as an ecological other. Uh, therefore, attempts to attach uh, interpret interpretative importance to the environment must be able to trace the social, historical, and material coordinates of categories such as, let's say, forests, rivers, bioregions, species. And what this means is to invoke a way of historicizing the problem of anthropogenic crisis from a post-colonial perspective, which means that engagement with the term nature must be historicized to foreground a biocentric approach to explain the ecological problems that we are facing in the Anthropocene. So it is in these theoretical frames that I want to insist on the category of the folk to be able to particularize and historicize these attendant concerns in the Philippines. So if colonial discourse is taken to mean uh, as, as the dominant mode in studying eco-critical terms in literary studies, I argue that the folk is that which is constantly effaced by this dominance. However, this effacement is not entirely triumphant, primarily because it is the folk that resides in the residue, the discourse that remains in the margins. As such, uh, I view the folk as something that can reveal that moment of history in which nature has been understood or, or can be understood apart from its colonial trappings. And this is to acknowledge that any historical analysis, this is from Plumwood, of practices and patterns of ecological imperialism must return to this philosophical basis, acknowledging these forms of instrumental reason that for so long has viewed nature and the animal other as being external to human needs and thus effectively dispensable or as being permanent service to them and thus an endlessly replenishable resource. So the relationship between human and non-human, uh, the, the illusory divide between nature and culture, seems to oscillate between care and contempt. 
So the task of stewardship, for example, um, in investing tradition uh, is a moral directive that emanates from a genuine desire to live harmoniously with nature, such that all threats of ecological crises are abated. However, given the unpredictability of nature, disastrous and calamitous events elicit a negative reaction from humans. So I bring this up to highlight one of the central issues that eco-critical studies um, reckon with, which is ecophobia. Uh, given the need to define and recognize the discourse that names the object of study of eco-criticism, I turn to eco-critic um, Simon Estock's definition, wherein he thinks of ecophobia as an irrational and groundless fear or hatred of the natural world. This is further um, corroborated by David Sobel's deployment of the term, as well as to describe the, the phenomenon of fear of ecological problems in the natural world. So to name this object of study in the discourse of eco-criticism is to define properly its methods. And so eco-criticism reads against ecophobia, or more precisely, we attend to the problem of ecophobia the moment we deploy the theoretical apparatuses available for an ecocritic. So this is what we're looking for when we do ecocritical study. So thus, ecophobia for Estoc has been the defining phenomenon that characterizes the human nature relationship as conceived in literature and also in real life. And this ecophobic rhetoric is what is revealed and analyzed every time a literary text is subjected to ecocritical analysis. Uh, furthermore, according to Estoc, ecocriticism makes explicit the recognition of environmental control as an implicit component of ecophobia. So um, in Western consciousness, this goes, way, this goes way back to the biblical creation myth, where stewardship is the divine authority given to humans and has produced the idea of control and regulation as a, per, as a pervasive force in the, in the popular imagination. Furthermore, one of the ways in which this narrative has seeped into uh, global consciousness is through colonial discourse, right, uh, through religion, that characterized the impulse to tame the earth and its wilderness. So the justification that is latent in colonial discourse is to domesticate nature in the language of discipline. Thus, nature must be conceived as something that, is, uh, th that must be contained, right, in order for narrativity to blossom. Uh, nature here must first be established as other, as exotic, but must then be overcome to understand its secrets. Um, savagery, wilderness, and alterity are all necessary invocations to imagine nature as bad. And propagating this imagination necessitates that contempt and fear become the constitutive emotions that mark any encounter of the human with nature. So such errancy as that particular moment of relinquishing control or a transgression that arises from a lack of control um, I think becomes a necessary counterpoint to ecophobia precisely because it dramatizes the nascency of this fear and contempt to the natural world by allowing crisis to happen in narrative. And so um, in inviting environmental errancy to happen in a narrative, we ask ourselves about these feelings and attitudes that we have about the human nature relationship at the brink of collapse. We can inquire about the constitution of this relationship and therefore reveal the assumptions that we have about the natural world at large. So I argue that when folk is read eco-critically, um, such concerns will have to be fleshed out precisely because as narratives concerned with cosmogony, the human nature relationship is at the core of understanding how these ecophobic relationship discourses spring from our literary tradition. So the literary tradition that I'm trying to um, analyze here and, and to read eco-critically is particular to the, to the Panay Bukidnon, an ethno-linguistic group that reside in the highlands of Panay Island, and the epic tradition is called the Sugidanon from the Hiligaynon word Sugid, which is to narrate. And the Sugidanon has been orally transmitted from generations to generations among shamans and the uh, Binukots or the well-kept maidens of Panay Bukidnon. So just a brief um, context about the, the corpus that, that I'm trying to study. So the Sugidanon is, is a mega epic uh, containing episodes called Bulos. And the bulos can be chanted um, independently of each other, but as a whole, uh, they provide connectivity in terms of the characters, settings, and themes. And in particular, these themes are, you know, a general picture of Panay social life, um, customary laws, um, its maritime environment. These are very prevalent in the epics, and uh, spiritual and ritual ritualistic uh, worldview. So, serious uh, academic inquiry um, from the academic community started uh, around 1955 when Iloilo-born um, anthropologist F. Landa Hukano um, recorded and transcribed and translated uh, what would then be um, the, the Hinila wood from uh, a local chanter called uh, Hugan'an. And his work was later on um, um, 
continued by his student in graduate school, um, Alicia Magos, who um, did field work in, in the highlands of Panay and met to Ohan, uh, Hogan An's uh, nephew. And together they collaborated to transcribe, record, and translate um, the, the Sugidanon in printed form. So the research group led by Dr. Magos would eventually produce um, 10 bulos in various translations in, in four languages, in archaic Kinaraya, a language spoken in, um, in Panay, a contemporary Kinaraya, which has a close resemblance to Hiligaynon, uh, my native language, Filipino and in English. So this would eventually comprise the Sugidanon in printed form. So the goal of this project is obviously to preserve and to generate scholarly interest um, in the Sugidanon. Uh, and, and I think uh, as of um, press time, we have eight out of the 10 bulos published by uh, the UP Press. So, sorry. So, a brief um, summary of, of the, the, the bulos that I'll be discussing for today. Uh, the first bulos, uh, entitled Tikum Kadlum, begins with the premise of environmental errancy. So, the epic hero Paiburong is tasked to hunt for food in the form of wild animals. And with him is his trusted aid, the enchanted dog, uh, Tikum Kadlum, uh, as seen in the cover of the book. Um, and Tikum Kadlum stops at a, at a nearby tree, a bamboo tree, and barks at it to signify something strange and supernatural about the tree. Now, Paiburong gets annoyed uh, at the incessant barking and tries to remove the dog from the, from the scene. And yet, despite numerous efforts to, to do that, um, Tikum Kadlum still um, barks at the tree. So, so um, Paiburong decides to cut off the tree, right, to, to um, get this over with. But unbeknownst to him, this, this proves to be a mistake because the tree is actually a sacred tree which contains uh, a gold bell-shaped object uh, tied to the tree and this object belongs to the aswang named Makabigting. And um, upon learning the transgression committed by Paiburong, the aswang Makabigting um, arrives at the scene, uh, decides to kill Paiburong on the spot, but he was swayed by the apologies of the epic hero and said, okay, as a compromise, um, Makabigting convinces Paiburong to give up his two daughters, uh, Matanayon and Surangaon, um, as, a, as a payment for, uh, for the fallen tree. So when the appointed time came, the Aswang took the daughters and they were brought over to the house of Makabigting where they grew up under the care of Makabigting's sister, Amburukai. And then the second epic, entitled Amburukai, uh, continues this narrative. So the environmental errancy provided here is caused by a desire to struggle against nature, which is to hunt for subsistence. So the wild animals being hunted here presents for me an interesting case to argue for the construction and conceptualization of what wildness means in the Panay Bukidnon imagination. So already there is a demarcation of what can be considered within the domain of the domiciliary, which is to say tameable, safe, certain, vis-a-vis -vis the world out there, signaled metonymically by a particular danger that lurks beneath the rustling of the verdant jungle. So if you look at the, if you look at the epic, for example, the, the karaya word, the word used in the epic to describe wild animals is ilahas, right? So for example, manakop kang ilahas na sapat, right? search for wild animals. Uh, and, and I tried to um, uh, philologically extract the, the root word here, which is um, ila, right? Defined by the Spanish lexicographer, uh, Father Alonso de Mentrida, who authored the Dictionario de la Lengua Haraya y Hiligüena, right? the, the, the dictionary for the Karaya and Hiligüena language during colonial era, uh, which points to um, ilahas as a wild animal or that which resides in the mountain. And this is further corroborated by the contemporary use of the word ila as wild, savage, ferocious, undomesticated, untamed, to be or become wild, right? Um, it's interesting to note also that the Filipino translation of wild uh, and, and wildness um, is mailap na hayop, so a quality that connotes wildness as something that is hidden and resists being caught. So coming from these uh, philological traversals, wildness designates a particular quality marked by a certain distance from the domain of safety and that which remains elusive. So this points to a conception of wildness that posits nature in a state of uncontamination that when disturbed, provides the instance of danger. I wanted to um, compare also 
right? If if I'm to 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 productively um, come up with a distinct vocabulary uh, and eco-critical register to talk about um, you know the Philippines, but to contrast the the idea of wildness um, from 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 a Western tradition. So eco-critic Greg, uh, Greg Garrard, for example, traces the idea of wildness as a construction mobilized to protect particular habitats and species such that it has an almost sacramental value. It holds out the promise of a renewed, authentic relation of humanity and the earth, a post-Christian covenant found in a space of purity, founded in an attitude of reverence and humility. He argues that the concept of the wilderness, a construction of nature that was most readily at home with New World environmentalism, only gained prominence in the 18th century, specifically during the Industrial Revolution, um, as a place for the reinvigoration of those tired of the moral and material pollution of the city. As such, it can be intuited that wilderness as a figure of alterity arose from this deep-seated anxiety of the modern subject to find comfort in dwelling despite the rapid degradation in both ecological and moral terms that modernity itself brings. This disposition is to project this anxiety to nature itself such that one can situate this attitude as truly ecophobic. So I go back to the epic. So when we examine the epic in terms of these categories of wildness and ecophobia, um, a complication arises, right? We say that modernity has cast off the folk as belonging to wildness, which is typical of the, the, the trope of the noble savage, for example, that has for so long been the qualifier for indigeneity. But yet the folk itself has already configured wildness as that other space that needs to be controlled to allow for sustenance and habitation to take place. However, in the epic, I found that the hero must also possess this attitude of wildness, right? Uh, um, one of the definitions for, for um, ilahas is also persona braba, right? Pertaining to a person in which wildness is conferred as a human quality. In order for the epic hero to, to succeed, right, in, in sustenance and to, uh, for, for habitation, he has to productively struggle against nature. And the, so the, the term here is associated with valiente or arisgado, uh, which point to the multiple valences of wildness when conferred to a person who must tame nature. So in short, uh, the epic hero must mirror the quality of nature in order for the latter to reveal itself, right? to lay bare its secrets, and in the process become instrumental for the survival of the human. So these provide the textures by which wildness is imagined and articulated in the folk archive. Now, how does nature respond to all of this, right? So first, we already have Tikum Kadlum as having a non-anthropocentric point of view that cautions the epic hero about the imminent threat of wildness. So right after departing his dwelling to hunt for food, Paiburong notices that Tikum Kadlum was incessantly barking at um, the tree. And yet, Paiburong remarks that nothing can be heard, nothing can be felt. Right? Paiburong readies himself to anticipate an encounter with wildness but is crestfallen upon knowing that there is nothing to see, right? He dismisses the dog as being foolish or buang. He is stupid, right? This dog, Tikum Kadlum. So to appease the dog, he decides to cut down the bamboo at which the barking is directed at, only to realize that it belongs to um, the Aswang Makabigting. And so I, I think this raises questions about um, the kind of legibility and comprehensibility that we have when we're faced with a non-human other, right? Especially when all of these are implicated in um, questions of wildness. So I read this scene as uh, something that presents to us an instance of the frontier of eco-criticism that needs to be articulated further. So in many ways, eco-criticism is devoted to the agentic representation of nature to truly really speak about itself. However, this articulation can only cover the hermeneutic circle that has at its core human logic. So eco-critic Ignacio Ribo, for example, problematizes uh, this fluency and facility in articulation as the speechlessness of all those non-human others that are excluded, not just from literature and social discourse, but from human language itself. So I ask myself, what are we to make of the dog's barking as a, as a caution to environmental errancy? In the epic, Paiburong obviously dismisses this warning as merely noise, right? Um, therefore not worth his time. And so this immiscibility between the human logic that tries to understand and the non-human articulacy that tries to speak becomes a crucial point that eco-criticism tries to resolve by pointing towards an interpretative gesture that demands from humans an attempt to displace this anthropo anthropocentric logos. So similarly, Ribo calls for a hermeneutic turn to deal with this problem that plagues eco-critical study that remains fixated on the literary assets base. 
So this turn to ethnography is what the folk archive can bring to further enrich a theorization of eco-criticism imbued by pra praxis. So as folkloristic studies inevitably entail an ethnographic dimension, the archive has much to say about these sentient beings that have long been overshadowed by human consciousness in literary discourse. So the epics have long been a rich trove of indigenous knowledge that offer alternative ways of looking at dwelling, nature, and non-human consciousness. So for example, in, in the instance of Paiburong's misrecognition of Tikum Kadlum's foolish or, or Pagbinuang, right, which, which privileges a certain kind of sanity, a certain kind of uh, logic that, that um, can only be understood um, anthropocentrically, um, leads to the possibility of inquiring, let's say, about the role of critical animal studies to study animal behavior in ways that have never been done before. The assumption that the non-human other is able to speak but not in a language known to us yet can be a way to cast off ideas that the world can only be explained by the privileging of human um, dominion. Another point to make here is that the Tikum Kadlum is non-human, uh, it, it's a dog, and domesticated, that is to say opposed to wildness established earlier, presents another layer of uh, complication in this reading of errancy and ecophobia. So what this scene tells us is that wildness needs to be tamed and understood. And yet, even when it is tamed, it still does not guarantee total comprehensibility. How to bridge this gap is the pressing question that the epic seems to provide a pedagogical insight about. So in a way, the epic tells us quite didactically to be attuned to nature, right? I go back to the excerpt here of uh, Paiburo saying nothing can be heard, nothing can be felt. The resonance with nature is rendered in the epic as an, as an imp impulse to, to feel nature, right? Nabatian uh, or batsyag in um, Hiligay non which in Intrida's Dictionario has as its cognate bate or to hear. And both are defined actually as sentir or to feel. So how do I make sense of this uh, triangulation? I feel um, hearing, sensing, and feeling um, seems to be the affective response that overrides this anthropocentric logic, such that to be intimately linked to the language of nature requires an intuitive, if not an affective, sense of one's relationship to nature. And perhaps this is the study the, sorry, the challenge to eco-critical study by way of the folk, right? To be able to articulate a theoretical standpoint by which affect as empathy becomes the foundation for dwelling in and with nature. So in the epic, Paiburong sentience is faced with its own limits and is thus enjoined to develop a hypersonic way of hearing the language of nature. So this notion has always been at the core of environment studies, from learning, let's say, about animal psychology to marking out patterns of botanical behavior, such that listening to the non-human other is indeed possible. So in fostering this capacity to sense and feel with nature, right, bati and batsyag, ecophobia can be recast from control to care, such that an articulation of wildness can be seen not just in terms of difference, but wildness as sameness. And even though such a turn may have enjoyed currency now in contemporary eco-critical thought, I argue that the folk, specifically in a regional Philippine context, has already anticipated it. So it's also interesting to note here that Makabigting serves as the keeper or guardian of nature. He's typified as a, the, the, the guardian of nature. And yet he is described as a tagubalbal or a noble man who committed the taboo of tasting or eating human flesh. This errancy is also what makes Makabigting the ultimate figure of wildness, such that to commit this transgression is enough to cast him away from the domain of human habitation and designate him as a monstrous figure. One must therefore be, uh, the, the epic tells us that one must be careful not to anger the tagobalbal, such as by disrupting the natural order of things in nature or else their consequences will happen. Now, I move on to the second um, epic, second bulos, um, because the epic also presents this strange juxtaposition of the figure of nature embodied as monster dwellers as both frightening but also, I argue, caring. So after obtaining the two daughters from Paiburong um, named Matan Ayon and Surangaon, uh, Makabigting returns home and tells his sister to, to boil a pot, right? And so this is indicative of him giving in to the desire of the aswang as, you know, he's ready to eat the, the two daughters. However, Amburukai's maternal instinct kicks in and says, um, I will keep the daughter inside the gold chamber. And she even cautions Makabigting to not enter the room for fear that her brother might fall in love with, uh, with the daughters. So she becomes emotionally invested in their growth, right? She becomes a mother figure to them to the point of claiming them 
as her own children. Uh, in one of the scenes, she refers to them as um, with my young ones, with my newly, newly grown children. But in, in Filipino, for example, sa aking huling sibol, sa aking mga bagong bukadkad. Uh, I find this um, interesting because there is a botanical imagery here that is quite uh, appropriate, right? For the daughters, uh, were the price to be paid for the fallen tree, and yet they grew under the auspices of this monstrous figure, only to bloom again, to blossom again as flowers, right? Huling sibol and bagong bukadgad. So in a way, this recuperative aspect of the narrative presents a complication to the very figure of nature as monstrous. So in the second epic, the narrative begins with Labaw Dunggon, uh, a new character, uh, he was strumming his guitar and it breaks, one of the strings break. And so he must never find a replacement and upon conferring with his spirit friend Taghoy, they decide that um, the best replacement would be Amburukai's golden pubic hair. So he ventures to the dwelling of Amburukai, enchants her to sleep, and successfully cuts out uh, you know, a portion of her pubic hair. And unbeknownst to him, um, and so obviously this, this angers um, Amburukai, and the, the entire epic is actually just her searching for the thief, right, in order to punish um, Labo Dunggon. What is so important about the pubic hair is that there is a sacred pact that is um, contained in this, in, this, in this object, right, that whoever manages to get hold of it must marry Amburukai, the aswang. So Labo Dunggon is obviously not in the business of marrying a swang. This is something that's frowned upon or even, you know, uh, unthinkable in, in Panay Bukidnon, um, myth, uh, the, the, the mythic universe. So Labo Dunggon is resigned to his faith of marrying an aswang. But during the wedding day, it is revealed that Amburukai deems Labo Dunggon worthy, uh, worthy enough to marry off her adoptive daughters. And so after seeing her daughters attaining happiness with Labo Dunggon through marriage, Amburukai retreats back into the wilderness. <coughs> Sorry. So crucial to this narrative is the foregrounding of the sacred contract, which is called Tuos, um, which is defined in the epics in many ways as a pledge, a vow, a gift of high value or something very precious uh, in order to seal a promise for an oral argument. So the Tuos is what maintains order not only in the epic world, but also in, in the customary laws of, of uh, Panay Bukidnon um, society. So the Tuos is what maintains order primarily because once it is broken, a reparation must be made in the form of equivalence. So in Tikum Kadlum and Amburukai, the Tuos is that which secures the bond between human and nature. So in the first epic, for example, the, the, the fallen bamboo tree, in the second, uh, the, the pubic hair such that any form of malevolence should be repaid with, uh, with a form of sacrifice in order to rest restore the balance caused by errancy. In particular, the Tuos is what, tuos is what keeps, is what keeps, what keeps Burukai, such that she makes the proclamation of not letting them go unless the Tuos inscribed in her pubic hair is broken. So Amburukai sets the parameter for such an exchange. Whoever gets a hold of her pubic hair should exchange his life for it. But if a man is, if such, if, if that man is good looking, a distinguished nobleman, she will relinquish her control over her daughters to the man who will become their husband. As such, in the second epic, once Amburukai discovers the thief, Labaw Dunggon, she reneged on her initial threat and decided to marry off uh, her two daughters. So I, I'd, I'd like to think of, the, of to us here as a, as a kind of uh, retribution, uh, sorry, as a kind of reciprocation, a kind of um, environmental justice that has to be upheld in order for um, not only the, the, the bios, but also the socials to actually um, have order, right? And so what is at stake here in, in the Tuos, for example, as a form of reciprocity um, that outlines the full conception of the human nature relationship that is on one hand premise on ecophobia, I argue that the figuration of nature here is not absolutely monstrous, so as to render humans perpetually in fear in the face of such entities. So when thinking about reciprocity, when thinking about to us as a kind of justice between, um, the, the, that keeps the humans and, 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 and non-human entities um, uh, in order, um, I turn to the local lexicon of Hiligaynon that best describes this, this, this moment of reciprocation. And this is called balos. I can't think of a, of a, a Filipino translation for it. Uh, but but Balos here in, in Mentrida's um, entry, for example, would, would talk about a certain kind of retribution, but it's uh, a retribution that can be good for good or evil for evil that pertains to one's deed or words. So uh, in, in contemporary Hiligaynon, for example, uh, Balos refers to a reaction of equal or greater magnitude that repays a preceding act. 
So one does perform, one would perform balos out of gratitude or revenge. So in makabig things case, the balos is you cut off the tree, I will get your daughter, right? And in Aburokai's case, the balos is you cut off my pubic hair, I will. Um, you have no choice but to marry me and and live with the consequences, uh, and live with the consequences forever. So um, I think of balos as, as something that um, we are able to make sense of the errancy. In, in both um, epics as implicated in a network of reward or punishment, right? Or better understood as a circuit of gift giving. The repercussions of these errancies demand a sacrifice on the part of humans. And yet we also see this gesture being done by Amburukai. And so this is the strange part because the balos that Amburukai gives is not so much a, a, a threat or, or, a, or, a, or a revenge, but actually of a positive kind. So it's a positive kind of balos wherein she gives off her daughters to Labaw Donggol. So she sacrifices her daughter. It's her reason for being. Right, the entire epic is really just about her uh, and her emotional bond with with um, Matan Ayon and Surangdaon. And so, despite configured uh, as a monstrous figure, Amburukai rewards actually the, the thief Labaw Donggon uh, as a form of ultimate sacrifice. As such, Labaw Donggon becomes beholden with this gift because more than the gift as that which demands reciprocation, um, the gift by its very nature, right? It is in the nature of a gift to impose an obligatory time limit. You have to repay the gift. So I turn to the last scene of, of uh, the second epic, Amburukai, in which uh, she retreats from the wilderness, retreats to the wilderness. Amburukai's departure circumvents the logic of gift giving because time is needed in order to perform any counter service. But by asking her daughters to stay here for a while, we are preempted with an eventual return at a designated time that is yet to be announced. This departure signals an arrest of the time contract in gift giving such, a, such that it is stretched out to eternity, which is to say that Balos dissolves in the outpouring of Amburukai as an embodiment of nature itself. So nature here, I argue, refuses to adhere to the time limit of reciprocity because it is already configured and poised towards giving its excesses. Amburukai's Balos is then reconfigured into something that is not just the object that is given totally to the human, but precisely as a gesture of making oneself the gift. So in short, the gift is what one makes to the self, right? The gift distilled to the assertion and sacrifice of the self of Amburukai. Her willful neglect of the time contract enables us to understand, for me, the amorous reply of nature to the erring human. So this effective um, response that is now demanded uh, from Labaw Dunggon towards nature and so, uh, from humanity itself, when we read the epic, is what is being uh, read eco-critically. The ecophobic rhetoric dissolves in this implication of the affective discourse of nature's amorosity as perpetual gift-giving, which is to say that the desire to preserve nature is not so much animated by contempt or fear, uh, of the disaster, but because nature is in itself a subject that demands from the other, from humans, an amorous response. And so I think this is what, um, how we read against ecophobia, right? When we think about um, this amorous um, economy that, that uh, pervades in the epic, and I, again, I turn to the, to the um, multivalence of the Hiligaynon word for this affective response, a, a, a distinct species of eros as langa, right? Uh, langa in, in the dictionary would refer to to be one's gift that is given. So when, when somebody says, for example, in Hiligay, no, palangga taka, to express the tenderness of love to the other, um, I think it's productive for me to think this way, uh, to, to create um, a, a, a certain categories, a certain um, distinct lex lexical species that can be used to develop this, this vocabulary to understand the human nature relationship in the epic as ecophilic, right, uh, buoyed by the folk belief in us. So in the end, the epic becomes a living contract of this vow, essentially of eternal repayment for a gift that has always been there, such that when we revisit Amburukai's question uh, at the end of the epic, it becomes a constant reminder of this gift, right? What else are you looking for? What else are you asking for? So langga for me becomes this um, particular um, critical term to be able to, to, to develop fluency and facility to, to think about fostering care, at least how the Panay Bukidnon understood this uh, relationship that they have with, with nature. So as a, uh, as a conclusion, I think in developing fluency to articulate eco-critical thought rooted in culture and history, the folk archive is indeed a wellspring from which collective knowledge can be further scrutinized to give us new insights 
about how we see ourselves and the world, right? These narratives allow not only for us to revisit the folk imagination in the way that, that they conceived a harmonious relationship between humans and nature, one that remains idealized and therefore aspirational, but also to reimagine ways of living that somehow resist the acceptance of the world as it is. So these become all the more crucial at the time where the Anthropocene follows the logic of apocalyptic time, right? We, we imagine the natural order of the world the, uh, that is hurtling towards its own destruction. Thus, it should be illuminating to see how an eco-critical reading of folk literature equips us with a disposition that imagines a more, a more livable world, right? A, a, a world where ecophilia is actually there. And concepts such as wildness, dwelling, sentience are charged with a local and therefore more immediate context to bring about environmental praxis. And I think this is really important. Environmental praxis that is attuned to and is constantly informed by indigenous knowledge. So in making a claim for the provenance of eco-critical eco thought in, in folk literature, we can conceptualize and codify eco-critical terms that can be organically drawn from, um, from the knowledge of, of from, from folk knowledge, right? To further challenge and unsettle global theories, to be more inclusive of, of systems of thought that for, for the longest time have been, uh, have, have been relegated to the periphery of literary studies. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Sim. Um, we'll now go to uh, Ma'am Lily Rose. Okay, I'm, am I unmuted? Part. Yes, Paul. Am I unmuted? Yes, Paul. Okay, so first of all, congratulations team. Uh, this is uh, a very solid study of uh, the epics of Panay. Uh, let, me, let me just read out some of my comments here. Uh, the paper is a welcome contribution to Panayanan studies, a field that seeks deeper understanding of a regional culture, often overshadowed by cultural interest in modern Metro Manila. The paper seeks to articulate a Panay cultural identity through its epics, similar and yet different from the other epics in the Philippines. The critical strength of the paper lies in its use of the eco-critical framework which is actually both old and new, but which argues more strongly for laying out the relationship between human and natural elements on an equal level, thereby necessitating uh, ferreting out the unarticulated aspects of nature's expression. Eco-criticism is not without its issues, as Tim has pointed out. What is nature? What is human? are not easy questions to answer. Nonetheless, the paper tries to problematize what would have been otherwise accepted as normal or naturalized relationships between nature and man. What raises the ante is the, race, is the use of folklore, where often what is nature and what is human inevitably blur. The study is a potent brew of all these discourses and the success of the blend depends upon the dexterity of the critical hand. In general, I find the study strong and lucid, quite substantiated with critical discussions and with close reading of the primary text. So when I, what I will point out here will be areas that can be further discussed. So number one, the idea of ecophobia, while easily defined, is to me still a very shaky idea. What can be ecophobic can easily be ecophilic as well. So maybe a longer discussion on the malleable nature of ecophobia can be done. Number two, the idea of wild or wilderness is also relative. Anthropologically, there is no such thing as wild or primitive. So maybe some elucidation here will be good. Number three, tikum kadlum creates a moment when the dog becomes superior to the man. The dog warns, but the man destroys. The act of destruction reduces the status of man to that lower than the dog, thereby reducing Paiburong to a being lower than his dog. The philosopher Giorgio Agamben has introduced the idea of the bare life, where man and animal are equal, or the animal lives better than his human counterpart. So I'm just giving a suggestion here as to the reading no, of uh, the destruction of the bamboo. Number four, 
the Panayanan version of the Aswang actually intrigues me. Panay has been traditionally the home of the Aswang. So Kapis, Iloilo, Antike are famous for this elemental character. Unlike the Luzon representation of single women living alone, the Panay Aswang is male, although here he has a sister. He is also defined as cannibalistic. If the idea of cannibalism or is the idea of cannibalism regarded as a practice of nature? If so, how do you reconcile the idea of the aswang here as a conduit of, of human good? Um, and number five, I congratulate Tim for this solid paper, and I hope he continues to pursue this specialization. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.